Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Carol Robinson, who's uh, come all the way from Oxford. Carol is a structural biologist uh, using um, mass spectrometry to understand the basic structure of matter. And um, I think it's just worth emphasizing the importance of that discipline. Uh, I suppose if you're a, a physiologist, you'd look down on the psychologists who try to understand the brain in terms of emotion and cognition. And if you're a molecular biologist, you'll look down on the um, physiologists who tend to think of the brain as consisting of circuits and neurons. But um, looking down on the top of everybody should be the structural biologist who understands what things are made of. And I think if you're really going to get at a mechanistic understanding of a phenomenon, then you need that level uh, of information. I would have thought that's a pretty obvious thing to state, but I've noticed that one of the places that UCLA maybe is a little lacking is in structural biology. So I'm very grateful that uh, Carol should be able to come today and, uh, and talk to us about her work. So she's pioneered the use of gas phase structural biology um, and using large heteromeric um, bound to many other proteins has been successfully projecting them into a gas phase. It wasn't clear when she started her work whether that would actually tell you anything about uh, protein structure. Um, and she has really since 1994 with her work on the molecular chaperone grow L shown that in fact gas phase um, could actually be achieved and you could gain uh, structural insights into those large molecules. After success in projecting soluble complexes into gas phase, she tackled the challenge of characterizing membrane proteins, a problem she solved in 2008 by maintaining the membrane protein structure in detergent micelle. And her next goal was to eject protein complexes directly from native membrane fragments without the need of the micelle, and she achieved that goal in 2018. She, um, because of these achievements, has, of course, received a large number of uh, awards, uh, among which she's became the first female professor of chemistry at both Oxford and Cambridge universities. Uh, she's been the recipient of the Royal Society's Rosalind Franklin Award and Davy Medal Award. In 2015, she received the European Laureate of the, um, for L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award, which reflects not only her research achievements, but also her teaching and mentorship. Uh, she's received the 2017 Hans Krebs Medal, awarded by the Federation of European Biochemical Societies, the 2018 Field and Franklin Award from the American Chemical Society, and in 2013, she was the, awarded the title of Dane Commander of the Order of the British Empire for her services to science. So if that isn't enough, then here's Carol to tell you some science herself. Thank you. Well... Thank you, Jonathan, wonderful introduction. And thank you to everybody for making a really warm welcome. Uh, during my stay, we've been here nearly five weeks now and it's been wonderful to establish uh, collaborations and to meet new colleagues and to enjoy some sunshine, a uh, bit of a change from the UK at the moment. So thank you very much for the very warm welcome. So today I'm going to tell you about my journey from, not starting way back, but actually from starting with membrane proteins and now going towards the brain region. And this is a sort of outline for the talk because we started with membrane proteins using recombinant complexes and this is an ABC transporter. And as Jonathan said, they were always micellated. We went through looking at very large complexes such as rotary ATPases made famous by Paul Boyer of course UCLA. UCLA. Um, and then one of my dream experiments has always been to capture receptor signaling across a native membrane and achieve this in 22. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then looking deep into the membrane, could we see metabolites that are somehow trapped within these transporters and receptors? would they give us a clue as to have their function? And with that type of technology, plus the fact that we can now prove that our complexes are folded and do look like we imagine that they do using a, a cryo-EM technology whereby we can collect and now visualize our complexes, we now think that we can go into regions of the brain and start to ask questions about receptors and transporters in the blood-brain barrier and how they might be 
impaired in depressed patients as opposed to healthy and age match controls. So that's kind of a long outline. And of course, as Jonathan mentioned, everything we do is in the gas phase. So you have to have that caveat. We're always thinking about how structure is affected by this phase transition of coming out of a solution environment where everyone's very happy to accept that that looks as we imagine, and then flying, rather like the bird at the top there, through a mass spectrometer in the gas phase. How does that change the structure that we're trying to capture? And although this is actually my first in a very long time talk in the neuroscience seminar, I do have a little bit of credibility. Um, this is a very old paper of mine. Um, in 1983, I think it's in a journal that no one's ever heard of or <laughs> ceased to exist. Um, it's called Substance P. And it was all about sequencing peptides from bovine spinal cord. And it was something that I did in my PhD. And I feel there's two life lessons here. One is you shouldn't change your surname because nobody ever associates these papers with me. And you always end up doing something similar to what you started with because I started my life um, taking things out of mammalian spinal cord and probably the last decade of my career is going to be taking things out of mammalian brain so you, you go full circle you start and you come back to where you started from um, but you shouldn't change your name <laughs> not a good idea <laughs> and this as Jonathan mentioned was quite a landmark for me because I'd always wanted to be able to study membrane proteins I'd sort of cut my teeth on many, many soluble proteins such as GROEL and lots of very um, standard enzymes, et cetera, et cetera. But to be able to look at a membrane protein, I always imagined would allow us a really new and big and exciting window on the world of um, sensations and transmission of pain and all sorts of other things. So this is an ABC transporter. And at the time we were keen to shake off the detergent in the gas phase of the mass spectrometer because if you try to deplete the detergent before you push it into the back into the flight path if you like to think of it like that you end up with a blocked needle and no spectrum at all so you have to keep it soluble you have to keep it happy you have to keep it in detergent and then you use the instrument to effectively shake this off i'm not sure if this is going to work yeah so this is a very old movie but it highlights what you would see if you were sitting in front of the mass spec and you were tuning it, you were adjusting these voltages at the top here, such that eventually you've shaken off all the detergent and you get a really, what I consider a beautiful spectrum, which corresponds to this ABC transporter, now devoid of detergent. And it became very apparent very quickly that these membrane proteins were not going to come by themselves. They were always going to come with them, some hint as to what membrane they were in or what uh, lipids or metabolites might be affecting them. And being a sort of purist mass spectrometrist, I didn't know that I liked it because at first they always looked slightly impure and in mass spectrometry, we always like nice sharp peaks. We don't want any of these satellites, but these satellites turned out to be very critical turned out to be informative, not only as to where they came from, but perhaps how they're signaling, perhaps um, how we could use this information to understand some of the many, many receptors that have not yet been uh, deorphanized. But as you know, there was a lot of controversy about this field. And around the same time as we published these early papers on membrane proteins, there was another paper um, which said for how long and under what conditions and to what extent could the solution structure be maintained without solvent. So always there's been this tension in the field between um, what things look like and how they may be distorted by this loss of, of solvent. And so that haunted my early career for a number of years. And so I'll tell you how we've overcome that recently. But first of all, just some very simple examples, which I think really illustrate the point of how important these lipids can be. So these are so two sodium proton antiporters, and we express them both in the same membrane environment. This is an E. coli version of a sodium proton antiporter, 
and this is from a Fomophilic species. And a lot of people don't like my spectra, but I think even if you don't, <laughs> these are very clear because this spectrum on the right is just very sharp peaks that we like and nothing else. So there's plus 10 here. This is the mass to charge ratio. So we can multiply this number by, um, sorry, that's not plus 10, that's 13. I can multiply that. The 10 is easier to work out. You can multiply that and you've got a 70 kilodalton membrane protein complex. <laughs> If you look at this one, you can see the dimer, which is shown by two subunits, is never present unless the lipids are present. So it really speaks to the fact that the lipids are stabilizing this interface. It almost like staples across the two subunits. Um, these are cardiolipins, so they're bidentate binding and stabilizing this particular dimer. And you realized we had a way of quantifying this stabilization and a way of understanding why lipids are sometimes necessary, for example, in a structure like this, but not in a structure like this, where we have a very, um, this one is stable, this one is not stable, and they have a sort of reduced stability in this direction. And it was actually while looking at these that I realized something, um, I'm not really a strong structural biologist, but I could see that this looked very much like this, and these in, inverted. But this is a G, these are all GPCRs, and whenever I was at conferences at that time, there seemed to be this debate about whether or not GPCRs signaled monomerically or via dimers. And I thought, right, we have a great way now to to look at this. We're going to look and see if they. I think they're going to be lipid mediated because we can see a little bit of fatty acid density has been modeled in here. So perhaps they come together to signal via lipids and then pass their signal down, down to downstream signaling components. And Jason um, was the hero here. Um, this is Jason and they worked, I would say tirelessly to uh, look at the other A2AR receptor, adenosine receptor bound to a mini G, which is something that Chris Tate introduced. It's a G alpha subunit, beta, gamma, and a nanobody. So this becomes a pentameric complex. The reason why it was difficult, because many people say to me, well, if you look at a rotary ATPase, that's huge, and you manage to transmit that into the gas phase, and it's stable, and it flies intact. Why can't you do a GPCR? Well, a GPCR is, of course, out of the membrane, a very, very floppy, unstable thing so it's much harder to capture but what we did find was nothing at all to indicate dimerization during signaling but really critical lipids and these turned out to be critical not just for this particular gpcr but across a whole range of class a gpcrs and we believe that they help with the selectivity of the downstream g protein as well as the stability of this signaling complex. So they effectively help choose the G protein and then bring it up into the receptor. We realized, however, that it kind of went beyond the lipids. We now had a very good way of understanding agonists and antagonists and biased signaling pathways. So what we do here is to take our mini GS found to our B1AR, we add compounds, and then we read off, is it, are we going down the GI pathway or the GS pathway? This is 100% complex if it's orange peaks here. If it's blue peaks, that means that the receptor's still around. So we have a little bit of blue peaks here, receptor, but a tiny bit of complex. This is a partial agonist. These are both full agonists, complete complexation. The GI pathway, just a little bit with isoprenaline. And yeah, so a very sensitive way of understanding GPCR signaling, which we then um, spun out into a company because we got a lot of interest from pharma at that stage, but we didn't want to do 10,000 ligands a day. So now we're very happy to do that on the science part. Um, but what do those complexes actually look like? And as I mentioned, this has been something that's haunted the field. And we started looking at this back in, 
I think, while I was at Cambridge, there's something in around the 2000s, trying to soft land a complex onto a grid, have a look at it. And of course we chose Grow EL, very characteristic two ring thing um, that we could study. But EM wasn't as good as it is today. So partly my spectrometry got a lot better, but so did EM. And now the marriage has come together much more smoothly. And this is a paper from uh, just earlier this year. So Tim Esser and Stefan Raschenberg. Stefan is a recruit to the uh, chemistry department recently. And he brought with him really great ideas as to how to soft land protein complexes onto EM grids. And that gives you, going through the mass spec, land, take it out, run down, walk downstairs, put it into the EM, and you can actually see if your complex is the complex that you think it is. And so the way we designed it um, is to go onto our UHMR. So we have our normal front end, but then we come right through here. And we can do either room temperature deposition if we want to, or cryo deposition, ultra high vacuum. And we can split the beam, do all sorts of fancy things because we have this cryo shuffle. So we can, of course, with an iron beam, it's different to how you might normally prepare your EM grids because you can choose, you can divert the beam onto either side of this particular holder, which is uh, made of copper. We love, I love it, it's a very beautiful thing. Um, and you can keep it cold. And then, as, you, as I say, you can go in the same building downstairs and have a look. Um, this is beta galactosidase. I was interested in this and this is great. I was really interested to see if some of these signaling complexes or these membrane protein complexes looked as we thought they did. And this is now aquaporin Z, your favorite tuning thing. <laughs> and you can see many detergent molecules adhering here. Some fuzzy density around the edge, but really um, we can start to build structures um, and pretend to be structural biologists. <laughs> this is still a work in progress because we're trying to improve the resolution of the time and we have some ideas about how we can get that to go further. But my other great landmark in, in my career was when we managed to get complexes from membranes without using detergent. And the reason why I don't want to use detergent if I can help it is because it of course will change the lipids that surround your complex. You can we know that we can get more lipids, less lipids, depending on the detergent we use. So how do the properties actually change what binds? Um, and of course the dogma in the field is actually you can't do anything unless you dissolve it first in the detergent. But what if you didn't have to? What if you could have a, mem a native membrane, make a vesicle, and somehow encourage, um, either by some heat or some electrical attraction, try to pull those complexes directly from the membrane. Would that be a, ever a possibility? And um, the work of Thor Chara here, who came from the Weizmann Institute, he did this work on the vesicle preparation. The and he formed his vesicles by excretion or cell press, put them directly into our UHMR mass spectrometer, quite extreme conditions because you've got to pull these complexes directly from a membrane bilayer. And this is just showing one example from that particular paper in 2018. Uh, from detergent micelles, this is part of complex one, part of the Oxfos uh, regulation. And you can see that we have all of these colored subunits hanging together in this beautiful complex one structure, but it's very difficult to define the lipids. And that's because in a detergent micelle, it's quite a floppy arrangement, whereas in a real membrane, it's much more rigid and the lipids that you see here are really well resolved and they actually match exactly the number that were interdigitated into the structure by cryo So it's a much better way of looking at membrane proteins, but that's not really enough. <laughs> um, we want to do this experiment, which is capture GPCR signaling across a native membrane and then see if we can link it to proteins and metabolites. If we can do things like that, we're then ready to go into the brain and see if we can understand uh, signaling in the brain. So here we have, um, as you know, rhodopsin, 
doesn't signal in the in the dark. So we have um, a red litmus spectrometer. This is a photo. This is not a photo. This is a GPC island membrane interacting with transducer PB PBE six in the background here. So if we can do this, we can then capture this signaling process across a native membrane. And when I started this, I wasn't sure what we were going to see if it was ever going to work. But a lot of people said, don't do Redox. And everybody's worked on it for 40 years. You'll never be able to add anything new. But we're not deterred by that comment, because I think if you do something in a different way, you'll always find something different. And this is actually a lockdown experiment. So I'll just introduce you to, uh, this is my mass spectrometer. We moved one into a red lit room. And you can see here, I hope, spraying directly. This is a retina from a, a cow. And we've made the vesicle, we've put the vesicle into the mass spectrometer. This is Sian, she's got a mask on because it's a lockdown project, as I said. She puts on the light in a moment, hopefully it comes, yep. <laughs> and that initiates the signaling of the GPCR. And then what you see here, um, this is real time <laughs> signaling because the retinol comes out of the redoxin to form opsin. And then you can measure that in real time as the ratio of peaks change. I don't imagine that you kind of caught that on the screen there. So I'll show you what she was looking at. And this is Sian without her mask. She's a very <coughs> smart student. Um, this is redoxin in the dark. This is because cows can never be, um, Cows are slaughtered for human consumption, but nobody wants to eat the eye, so we have the eye, and, but they're never slaughtered in the complete darkness. So there's always a little bit of um, redoxin has already converted to opsin. But once you've exposed to light, you can see that, I hope you can see the ratio of the two peaks changes over this 40 minute period. And Sian was a very smart student. So what she was measuring was this loss of retinol to form opsin, redoxin, excited, forms opsin. But she didn't sort of follow, follow my instructions, which is probably a good thing, because I said, well, just put the light on and then monitor decay. And she did put the light on, monitor decay, but she decided that actually she would flash the light back on again. <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure why she did that, but it turned out to be very interesting. So. Retinal signals, it goes away um, and forms opsin. But if you flash the light button, it very quickly regenerates redoxin. And at first we couldn't understand that because well, that can't be right because maybe it goes off by an enzymatic regeneration process. How can it be so fast? You know, it's instant. And we sort of sat with it for a while thinking it was some odd artifact, but we never have. Artifacts are always just results you don't understand. And actually, what it turned out to be was it because it was the first time it was in a native membrane, it was actually capturing a lipid retinol intermediate sensor, a retinilidine lipid conjugate that, when you shine the light on, dissociates to liberate cis, cis retinol, which can then immediately come back into redoxin. So it's a very smart way of regenerating the redoxin in a sort of flash of light rather than going back through that whole regeneration process. And this was quite a long um, project for Sian and because we're physical chemists, we did lots of reaction rates and compared them to everybody else's in 40 year history, as I said. And fortunately, we found that we were slower, which was a great uh, discovery because it means that actually if you're in the membrane there's a lot of kind of torsion and force there to stop it flopping around and signaling much faster than it does in all the detergent micelle experiments that people have done until that time so we had a slower reaction in the membrane than in lmg but we could also look at downstream signaling to pde6 and cyclic gmp comes off so the whole um signaling pathway you can also look at transducin, losing, um, coming apart, and then the alpha subunit coming on to PV6 here. We can follow actually every step because they're all changes in mass. So it's a beautiful system for mass spectrometry, although that's not what it's for, of course. <laughs> um, okay. Doesn't work. Yeah. 
But there were a lot of other things. So I focused on rhodopsin because that's easy and, and good and nice. But this is from a cow eyeball. So you don't expect just pure rhodopsin. There's about 30 other proteins. And another lockdown project, and this is an <coughs> instrument manufacturer who's very close to here, actually, from San Jose and Perma Fisher, and two people uh, <coughs> from my company, one from my lab, collaborating as a lockdown tea time event every Tuesday to design a mass spectrometer that would allow us more control over breaking vesicles, releasing their contents and understanding. And this has a lot of implications for EEVs, for all sorts of other projects that we can dream up. And what happens here is we typically would take our uh, vesicle from our rod disc membrane, totally uninterpretable, even for me, no, that's not good. Um, but if we do it again, but this time we focus on IR laser here, we can now liberate these contents in a controlled way. And this has made my life so much more exciting because now we can get all sorts of spectra that we really can understand. We can understand all the contents of these vesicles and then we can also take up the laser and break the whole thing that we've now isolated and look at rhodopsin fragmenting. Let's have a look at that. Comes back and these are the fragments. And from that, we can now, I'll show you what we were able to do, release in a stepwise way these vesicles. Finally, at the highest power is rhodopsin, and all of these soluble proteins come off beforehand. So it's a very controlled way. We also know what they all are, and that's a big step forward. <laughs> we always had trouble trying to identify everything because we were basically using the mass at which the was in the database, which is not always right, of course, lots of modifications go on. And if you can't sequence, you're really a bit stuck. So everything here has now been sequenced by uh, sort of breaking it, looking at the fragments and identifying. So it could be lots of glycolysis proteins, of course, rhodopsin, but rhodopsin's not easy. Rhodopsin's glycosylated at the N-terminus, homitylated twice at the C-terminus, has lots of modifications and phosphorylations and all sorts of things to consider, but we've managed to top down sequence that, which in itself is not so interesting because it was largely known from uh, bottom-up approaches. Julian and his lab worked on rhodopsin in the very early days. And, but what we have, have been able to do is to look at it intact and see how the crosstalk between these um, differences occur. And to look, now that we've identified 30 proteins within this whole milieu, I can't say that very well, but in, in this cellular environment, we could now try inhibitors and see where they go, see which proteins they interact with. So this is a PDE5 inhibitor, it's a very famous one from Pfizer. I worked at Pfizer for a while, so they mean a lot. Um, so Vardenafil and Sildafinil target supposedly target PDE5, but are known to cross-react with PDE6. We see that Vardefinil binds twice, so Vardefinil only once. This actually was not known in the context of the whole Miller of the, Miller of the cell, because uh, most of this has been crystallographic, and it's been difficult to know whether or not both sites are occupied simultaneously, whether there's any cooperativity between the two sites. This is PDE6 with two molecules of valdafinil bound and only one of sildafinil. It's a heterodimer, two different subunits involved. What we also noticed, apart from off-target binding of PDE5 inhibitors, we also noticed some non-specific binding. As I mentioned, there's about 30 different proteins, but only those that are crenelated are binding to bardafinol, and that's because it's a very hydrophobic drug, and this is a very hydrophobic environment with these upper membrane very close. So that's the beta gamma and the alpha subunit of transducin in close proximity to PDE PDE six. So just to summarise, it's been challenging to fragment all of these meristillations and crenellations and pharmacillations without this IR laser. So this has been a really 
big step forward for us and this interdiscal space allows us to um, we can now look at these the cross reactivity of inhibitors targeted at PDE5 within this particular environment. Okay, so I'm going to kind of sum where we've got to. So that's the hydrophobic environment, and I'm in a neuroscience department. Don't worry, I will get to some neuroscience. I just wanted you to see the build up because it's taken me most of my career to get to this point of saying. Okay, now I have the tools. I can measure signaling, or we, shouldn't say I, we, and whole group can measure signaling across the native membrane. We can, I haven't shown you this work, but we can look deep into the membrane and see if we can see a lipid or a metabolite here. And we can take directly from a native like environment and fly directly into the mass spec. So, what would you want to do? Would you consider your greatest challenge? Um, well, I really wanted to look at the blood brain barrier, mainly because I never really understood what it was. And I thought it might be interesting to take the tools that we spent these 30 odd years developing and see if we can get some new insight into perhaps why brain behaves differently in different situations or perhaps how drugs get in or even the goal of this project, which is to understand what's different between a depressed and an aged match healthy control. So this is part of a um, great consortium where I met Jonathan, which has been great. So this is the idea of the multi-channel site LEAP, Welcome LEAP project, where they bring together all these uh, different labs around the world to tackle something that cannot be tackled by one lab. And you don't have to understand, for me it was good because you don't have to understand the brain. You just bring what you have and put it on the table and then they try and match up all, all the different partners ac across the world. Um, so this is my team in Oxford and this is my understanding of the brain. Actually, when I put in the proposal, there's a great proposal for you. You need to understand the brain. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> I do need to understand the brain. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was delighted to come here. You have very strong neuroscience here. And I thought we might be able to add value by understanding these transporters and receptors and how they might differ in, in regions of the brain, certainly they do, but in depressed and age match controls. The two I'm going to target were identified um, by a number of people in the consortium as being important. Um, that's the vesicular glutamate transporter, which obviously does what it says, um, glutamate and the metabotropic glutamate receptor. And this is an interesting one because it has many different flavors. It can go from one to seven, and then they can heterodimerize within membranes. And, and nobody really knows why they heterodimerize or if they have any kind of cargo in here. So this, so one of our theories, one of our hypotheses to be tested is that perhaps in a suicide brain, um, these are impaired. There may be some difficulty in getting this transport that we all expect um, to happen because there has been some evidence, very small evidence, that there are some impaired transporters in different types of depression. So we can't really start up with a lot of patients at this stage. So we're going to start with animal model. Um, I didn't do these experiments, so please don't complain that they're cruel cool, because I don't particularly like them because I used to keep pet mice. But, um, so you have an aggressive mouse who um, beats up a, a rather um, more feeble mice, let's say. And then you have, you get a sort of, you know, sus mouse who's not happy because um, it gets beaten up every day. So what happens in this experiment is you have a mouse and he's, the bully mouse is to one side. You let him come in and beat up all the mice, but he, the susceptible mouse sort of hides away. And you look for the susceptible mouse, um, and you can imagine the mouse, and, and you can see the susceptible mouse remembers the beating up of this bully mouse. And then after 30 days, um, well, actually day 12 in this experiment, they harvest the brain from the susceptible mouse this was a paper recently in Nature, so it wasn't, it's not my fantasy that this works. This has actually been proven now. Um, 
got proven as much as anything. Um, and then our goal is to take the mouse, the susceptible mouse, with the one who was not susceptible, and then compare. And you may think that's very far-fetched, it'll never work, which is what everybody said, but it actually does does work. We've managed to get this to work. This was actually quite difficult. So you've got a, a brain mush and you want to pull out an intact receptor or transporter. And it's got to be of a reasonably good quality or you're never going to be able to interpret the spectrum. And yes, this is a question I'm often asked and was asked this morning. Maybe it's just a difference of how much they're expressed in the two different brains. We can answer that because, of course, we can do quantitative proteomics and show no difference at all. Nothing that we can see different between the uh, susceptible and the non-susceptible mouse, control mouse. When we pull them directly, we needed to have a way of identifying the different mice. So we developed and designed this barcode, barcoded nanobody because we, we thought that we'd be doing lots of patients a day, and so we needed to have a barcode so that we could locate it to the patient. And then the barcode would break, and it's a specially designed peptide sequence that fragments, gives us a sort of barcode readout, so we'd be able to automate this whole process. It hasn't turned out that we've been doing that yet, but it's I think it's a very cool idea, so you, you get this readout. We know we have the protein of interest because we've got the nanobody, we've got the barcode, we can identify it, and what do we see? So here are, from a control mouse brain, the metabotropic glutamate receptor pulled out with a nanobody, and the V-glut one pulled out with a nanobody. So to me, this was almost, as I started my career, almost unbelievable that you could take a washed up brain and pull out an intact membrane receptor or transporter. I, as I said, I started with substance P from a, a spinal cord, and that was relatively straightforward, and we knew how to do that. We could prep it up by chromatography, but here we need to keep these folded and intact because the whole idea is that they might have different carbon. There might be something different about this one than this one that we would lose if we chewed it up and put it through HPLC, for example. And we found that, and this is now, slightly statistically significant because the susceptible mouse in its metabotropic glutamate receptor has a lot more monomer than the control mouse. Now, what, what does that mean? So to be functional, it has to be dimeric. So any movement to the monomer would suggest that this is actually not working properly. It needs to be in this peak, not this peak. And of course, we can get heterodimerous. We can talk about those today. I thought this wasn't a big difference, but then somebody said to me actually this week, if you're depressed or there's some different condition, don't expect a black and white change, expect a gradual, slightly different um, signal. So this is what we're seeing. We're seeing dimer, monomer, susceptible control, slight difference. Now we'll move to human. <laughs> and of course this has to be post-mortem. It's very sad. Well, I think it's very sad because um, my group found it quite traumatic. They're all of the age of the, the suicide brains that we received and that we have the notes, and, although they're smiling, so maybe they're not so traumatized. But <laughs> initially we thought, yeah, this is kind of somebody's part of the human brain and it was a big thing. So we matched as many as we could get from the Edinburgh brain bank with um, depressed patients and um, unaffected controls. We now have brain from an American laboratory, which is the Libra Institute, which has a lot more selection of brain parts and, and different things. So this is orbital frontal cortex or the Boardman area 11. And this is the recombinant protein in each case. And this is the control. Here we have the metabotropic glutamate receptor from a human brain and the glutamate transporter. So they're intact, they're working quite nicely. And now we go into what happens with the post-mortem brain. So this, um, uh, oops, sorry, with the depressed brain. So again, no history of depression, died of a heart attack. Quite normal pattern for us. Don't really understand. Major depressive disorder with episodes of psychosis. Um, very much 
perturbed. This is the vesicular glutamate. It has a lot of changes of mass. Are there things that we can now capture? This is a patient who also had major depressive disorder, a female, and you can see again, um, a very different pattern to our control experiment. So the tabotrophic glutamate receptor from postmortem brain is again, very much more monomeric in implying that we have some impaired transport going on when we have uh, these susceptible brains. So what do we conclude? We need to move on with this. So we want to explore this heterodimerization of the two and the three, and there are in fact up to eight. We can look at all the significant differences in, in the expression of these, but actually how they interact. You cannot get that unless you can keep them together in the mass spectrometer. So that's why it's very important to do it like this. And we can now sequence and see how much two and three we have in the patients. Um, currently, we don't have much difference between the two and the three, which implies that the monomer dimer ratio is affected by something else. And we're currently doing all of the lipidation, all the lipidomics and all of the metabolomics from those particular complexes. Complexes are purifying those. So we're not just taking the whole brain and looking for lipids and metabolites. We're using the complexes to purify that cohort. So we think there are different 